Hey, welcome back to Computer Science 340. Today we're going to keep talking about hash tables, and in particular we're going to talk about handling collisions. So last time we saw that hash tables are basically a way to store a bunch of information where you can insert new items quickly and you can also search for past items quickly. And by quickly we mean constant time, big O of one, which like I said is pretty much the best you can do. And so last time we talked about how do you set up a hash table by making an array, coming up with a hash function and doing these things, but we didn't handle the potential for having collisions where two values that you want to insert into the table, both are given the same integer from the hash function and therefore are going to go into the same place in the array. So today we're gonna to look at two different ways of solving this problem. One we'll look at in detail, and then one we'll sort of just talk about towards the end, an alternative way of solving the collision problem. And then at the end of today, we'll talk about like sort of best practices for hash tables and how do you set them up so that you can get the ideal big O of one performance. So let's go ahead and dive into that. All right, so right here we have a hash table that has three names in it so far. We've created the hash table to be an array of size 15, and then we've put three names in it so far, Alice, Bob, and Elaine, which got put into seven, three, and 11, respectively. And now we have the situation where our hash function is going to give us a collision. When we put Elena in it, based on the way we wrote it, it's gonna give us the same number. I didn't figure out if these are right, by the way, I just, just picked numbers. Uh, so, but whatever it is, it's gonna be a collision here. It's gonna give us the same integer for Elena as it does for Elaine. And so the question now is, what do we do? We can't just stick Elena on top of Elaine and overwrite that value because the hash table has to be sort of like robust to this. It has to be able to store both things in there somehow. So we need a better solution than just overwriting data. And as I said, there's actually a couple of different ways of doing this, but the most widely used, I think, solution is called linear probing which is an odd choice of phrasing, I think, for that, but that's what it is. And what that means is that what you do is when you have a collision, like we wanna put Elena in slot 11, what we do is we first check and see, oh, is this one taken? And if so, we just go on to the next slot here. And so we would, in linear probing, put Elena right past Elena in slot 12, like that. Then when we're going to insert somebody else, if we have yet another collision, like let's say we put, I don't know, mark through the hash function and it also gives us 11 as the index, well, we would go to 11, check and see that it's filled, so then we would go to the next location, see that it's filled, and finally put mark into 13. Just like when we were talking about the queue, it's possible that we'll have like a wraparound thing. So if the next thing we get, like let's say we put Wendy through this, and it gives us like location 13 as the index, we would see that 13 is filled by Mark, who wasn't even supposed to be in 13 in the original place. He was supposed to be in 11. So then we would put Wendy here. And then if another one is going to be mapped to 11 through 14, it would wrap around back to zero. So in the linear probing, you basically just insert it in the next available slot after the one that it's supposed to be in, wrapping around if needed. So that's the linear probing technique. We're also going to have to think about this though when we do our searches, our lookups from the hash table. So let's think about how that's gonna work. All right, so let's say that we go ahead and we do a lookup in this hash table, and now we look up Bob. Well, that's pretty simple, right? We put Bob through the hash function and we get out the number three because that's where we put him. And then we look in slot three and return that data. But what happens if we go ahead and we do the search for Elena? That's going to give us 11 like we talked about. And then we're going to go to slot 11. And now we can't just like assume that this is the right data and return whatever is in slot 11. We can't just do that anymore. We have to actually like verify somehow that 11 is in fact Elena, which in this case it's actually not. We have to check that that's right. And so to do that, what we have to do is we have to store both the keys and also the values inside of this hash table. So in the last example, we were like just putting the phone numbers into the table, but now that's actually not enough because if we just have the phone numbers, we won't be able to like know, you know, if it just says like, you know, 654-1714 in here, we won't be able to know whether this is Elena's phone number or as it is in this case, somebody else's. So both the keys and also the values have to be stored in the table. 
So what we do is we look up and we see if the key is the one we're searching for. And if it is, we return it. Otherwise, we do the same linear probing thing. We just go to the next slot and then we would check the key and see that in this case, it is Elena. So then we return 12's value from here. Likewise, if we were looking up Mark, we would again get 11 for the index and we would go here and see, is this key equal to Mark? And it's not. So we go down to the next one and say, is this key equal to Mark? And it's not. So we go down to this one and we see that the key is equal to Mark. And so we return the data out of here, whatever value is put in with Mark inside of this hash table entry. Then of course, if we go off the edge, like if we're looking for, uh, I don't know, someone who's not in the table, like Harold, and it gives us an index like, let's say 12. Well, we're gonna start looking here and then we'll probe down. And then when we get to a cell that's empty, then we return that it's not found is basically how this is gonna work. So linear probing in terms of the search means that you just start the search at the index that the hash function gives you, but you search from there onwards until you find the one with the matching key. So that's the idea behind the linear probing method of handling collisions in a hash table. It's pretty straightforward basically, but let's go ahead now and look at some code so that we can see how this is gonna be implemented. All right, so let's go ahead and make another hash table class, a better, stronger one that does things in a better way. One of the things we're gonna do is we're going to implement the linear probing technique so that it's like resilient if we have collisions. And we're also going to do that, of course, we're gonna to have to store the key and also the value inside of a hash table. I also went ahead and made this generic so that you can put in any type for the key and any type for the value so that you can make it like a hash table of strings to integers or strings to strings or integers to booleans or whatever you want. So let's go ahead and start. There's a couple ways we could do it for the beginning because we need to store both the keys and the values. And we could do one of two things. Basically, we could make one big array that has somehow inside of it both a key and a value. But to do that, we'd sort of have to like make another class combining the key and value into one object. So instead, I think it's gonna be simpler just to make two arrays. Uh, these are sometimes called parallel arrays because like slot two in the keys array is gonna to correspond to slot two in the values array. So I'll make private value array called values and then private key array called keys. And remember now that the way these generics work is key here is a type parameter given here. And we're going to fill that in later with the actual type. So this is gonna be replaced by like string or integer or student record or some kind of thing like that. So we can go ahead and make arrays of them. We also in this version of the hash table are going to make it be a parameter for how big it is. So I'm gonna make a private int called max size that keeps track of the total size of these arrays and so that you can pass it into the constructor like this. Then inside of the constructor, it's not too bad. We're just going to store max size to be size and then we can go ahead and allocate space for our array. So I'll say that values is a new array and now we have this problem with Java that I've talked about before, where it doesn't let you actually go ahead and make an array of a generic type like this. It makes you do an array of object and then cast it. So I'm gonna say this is an array of values and we're gonna to have to do this casting thing. So we'll do the same thing for keys. So basically what's going on here is I've created these two arrays that are the same size, one for storing all the values and one for storing all the keys. And we've created them to be generic, but to do that, we have to make object arrays and then cast them back. That's gonna give us a warning, but it'll be fine. So let me go to the whiteboard so I can explain what I mean with these two parallel arrays. So here we have an array called keys and a, an array called values that are both the same size. And what I'm saying is that when we go ahead and do an insert call, like let's say we insert again, like Alice at 555.1234, what we're going to do is we're going to put the key Alice through the hash function and get out whatever index she's supposed to be at, let's say at seven. And then we put the key at slot seven in the keys array, and then the phone number in slot seven in the values array. 
So the arrays are sometimes like when they're used like this called parallel arrays, because we're keeping track of the fact that what's in slot seven in one array somehow corresponds to what's in slot seven of the other array. All right, so moving back into our code now, we can tackle the insert method where we need to go ahead and put a key value pair into this hash table made up of these two arrays. Well, the first thing we need to do is go ahead and get our index from a hash function. But how can we get a hash of this key type when we don't even know what this key is? You know, maybe it's a string, maybe it's an integer, maybe it's a social security number, maybe it's some kind of other thing that we don't even know or can anticipate right now. And so Java actually has a built-in way of doing this. If you remember, every single class in Java inherits directly or indirectly from this class called object. And so we don't know what type of thing key and value are going to be, but we do know that it's some type of object. And in order to let us address situations like this, all object objects, so everything of class object, inherits a method called hash code. So even though we don't know what the key is, we can call key.hashcode, and that's going to give us ideally a reasonable hash method on this key. So what this does is it takes this object, whatever it is, whether it's a string or whether it's a integer or whether it's some kind of like employee object code or something, whatever it is, it's going to take it and it's going to give us an integer when we call the dot hash code method on it using some kind of hash function. Unfortunately, there's a few things that is going to happen now though, because this integer doesn't necessarily be, it's not necessarily between zero and the size of our hash table. It actually could be any integer at all, positive or negative. But of course, we don't want to deal with negative numbers and we don't want to deal with numbers that are bigger than our hash table size. So we need to do a few things to like make sure that it's in the right range. The first thing we can do is call the absolute value function on this to make sure that it's at least a positive number. So we'll call math.absolute value of the key code. Then the next thing that we do is we're going to modulus again by the max size of our table. Those two things together should make sure that it's a positive number between zero and one less than our table size. So that's how we get the index from this key object when we don't even really know what it is yet. That's one of the nice things about like polymorphism and those things you learned about in 240. Even though we don't know even what this key is yet, we can still go ahead and write our hash table function to say, however this thing does hash functions, give me the hash code for it, which is cool. Now what we need to do is we need to put it in the table at this location, but taking into account whether this spot has been taken yet. So if everything is okay, then the table keys or values will be null in the slot of the index. So I can basically say something like this. I can say, wow, the values array at this index is equal to, is, no, is not equal to null. Go ahead and increment the index, index plus plus. So if our values array is not equal to null, we need to keep going. We need to go one next in the array. And we need to keep doing that until the values at this index is null, because that means the spot is available. So this is our little linear probing loop right here. It's going to keep looping while the spot is taken, incrementing index by one each time. Then we're going to go ahead and insert the thing at that index. So I'm going to say values at this index is equal to the value passed in. And also we need to store the key as well, remember? So keys at this index is equal to the key passed in. And that's almost right, but here I didn't take into account the way that we need to wrap around off the end of the, the array if we get to the end. So what I really want to do is I want to set index equal to the index plus one. But if that is bigger than our max size, I want to modulus again by the max size of the array. So I think that should work for the insert method implementing this linear probing technique that we talked about. We go ahead and just basically increment index until we find a slot that's available. The next thing to talk about now is the lookup method. This is going to take a key and return the value to us, or it's going to return null if the thing is not found. We need to take that into account as well. 
Well, step one of this is going to be getting the index because we need to do that the same way as we did for insert. We need to use the same hash code that we did for our key, whether we're inserting it or looking it up. But then we need to loop until we find the thing that we're looking for. We're just using index as the starting location for the search. So for our loop condition, let's go ahead and let's say while the keys in this index doesn't equal null. So that this loop is basically going to keep going until it hits a null location. Of course, we could find the thing we're looking for, but we'll handle that with an if statement inside of this loop. Then if we get to the end of this loop and we haven't found the thing that we're looking for yet, we should go ahead and return null. So then at the end of this loop, we're going to do the same increment thing we do here because when we're searching, we also might need to wrap around the bottom of the array. The only thing we need to handle now is actually finding the thing we're looking for. So to do that, we need to check if this is the right key. So I'll say if the keys, the key at this index is equal to the key that was passed in. So this is another one of these methods that's in the object class in Java, this dot equals method. The nice thing about this is that we don't, again, need to know whether this key is an integer or a string or whatever. We can call this dot equals method regardless, and it's going to tell us if this key is equal to the one we stored in the array or not. If it is, then we found it, and it's at this index. So we want to return the one that's in the parallel array of values at that same index. So we start looking at this index given to us by the hash method. We're going to keep looping until we get to a null thing in the keys. When we hit the null thing in the keys, we're going to break out of the loop and return null because the thing wasn't there. Each time through the loop, we check if this key is equal to the one that we are searching for. And if it is, we return the corresponding value. Otherwise, we're going to move on to the next one by incrementing index, but making sure that we wrap around when it hits the edge. I think that all looks right to me. And even with the linear probing, this hash table is not terribly complicated. Let's go ahead and test it and see if this is working. Well, to test it, we need it to go ahead and have something to test it with. So I went ahead and made a hash table of strings to strings inserted some names and some phone numbers, and then printed them back out again. So let's go ahead and compile these together and see if it, see if it works. All right, so I'll do Java C. This is called hash table with a capital T. That's to distinguish it from the real hash table in Java, which is the same thing, but it has a lowercase t here. So it's best not to get confused. And then we have hash test.java, which is that little test program I just showed you. And I made one mistake which was that I forgot a semicolon, it looks like on line 10 and 11. Let me go fix that real quick and try it again. So this warning is because we casted our array of objects to the array of keys and values, and that's fine. We could put the warning eliminator thing in, but we'll just leave it for now. And then I can say Java hash test, and it looks like the first ones all gave us good phone numbers, whereas the last one returned null because it wasn't actually found. If we go ahead and look at it, Wendell was never put in, so it returned null, which is what it should have done in that situation. So I think this is all working and hopefully makes sense in the way that the linear probe is actually like implemented with code. Basically, we just have these little while loops that like keep looping through until we get to an available spot for indexing, for inserting, and until we actually found the thing we're looking for for lookup. Now, one potential problem with this code as we have it is that it doesn't work. It's not going to work if the hash table fills up all the way. If that happens, then this insert here is actually going to be an infinite loop because it's going to keep looking for an empty slot when there isn't one. And we could handle that, but for now, I think we'll just keep the code kind of simpler. And in truth, when you have a situation where a hash table is going to be the best data structure, you would need to know ahead of time about how much data you're going to have, and you would make your hash table big enough that it could store all of them. We'll talk about this in a minute when we get to talking about the analysis of this, but for a hash table to make sense, you need to have some sort of bounds on how much data you're expecting to get so that you can make your table big enough to house it all with some space left over because otherwise it's really not the right data structure anyway. All right, so that's linear probing. I mentioned that there's another technique for dealing with 
collisions, and we'll talk about that now. All right, the other technique for dealing with collisions that we'll talk about is called chaining. And in chaining, what happens is each slot of the array doesn't actually store only one value and key pair. Instead, it can actually store multiple. So let's go ahead and let me put some indices on here. Let's say that we have this data loaded into the hash table so far, and then we want to insert somebody else, like let's say Frank into the table. And Frank's hash code that we get from our hash function is a collision, let's say it's two. Well, what happens is every cell in the array isn't just a single object, instead it's actually a linked list of objects. And so what we're going to do is we're going to insert into the link list in slot two of our hash table, the new item Frank. So some of the cells of the hash table are going to be empty like this one. Some of them are going to store one item like this one storing Bob. And some of them are actually going to store multiple items inside of a link list. So basically what we do is we make an array of link list objects. And it starts out that all of the link lists are empty with the head equal to null. Then whenever we insert an object into the hash table, we call our hash function, get the index, then go to that linked list and insert the item into that linked list. And it could be a doubly linked list or a singly linked list. We can go ahead and say it's a singly linked list like this. So if I went ahead and added somebody new, uh, say Gina to the list, and we get an empty cell, like five, we would just go ahead and insert them into that link list. And so there would be now one node in the link list of link list five that's comprising our hash table. Then if we go ahead and get somebody else like uh, Harry, then we're going to go ahead and insert a new item into this hash table. And you would just do that as many times as is needed. If the next one is H I uh, go ahead and use my own name, Ian, that gets inserted in slot two then you would just add another one in here and you can add as many names or values or keys or whatever it is you're storing into each slot as needed. It would just go ahead and add new cells into the link list, uh, Jan. That's how chaining works. So chaining has an advantage over linear probing in that with a chained hash table like this, the thing can't ever really get full. It just gets less and less efficient the more filled up it gets. Like we could go ahead and fill up all of these cells with multiple things and it wouldn't ever like break the program or stop working or anything like that. Or we wouldn't even have to really handle the situation. It would just get less and less efficient as we go. Because now with chaining, of course, when you go ahead and do searching, you're going to get your hash code from your key then you're going to have to search through that corresponding link list that's in that cell. And of course, as we said, searching a link list isn't terribly efficient. You have to go through each cell, each node of the link list one by one until you find what you're looking for. So that is an advantage that the thing can't get full, but really if, you, if your thing gets full, then you kind of messed up by choosing a hash table anyway, because it's not going to give you any real performance benefits to have this thing completely full and with multiple things in each section. Using something instead like a binary search tree, which we're gonna talk about in a couple weeks, would have been better in that scenario. So I think from what I can see that linear probing is probably more widely used, but chaining is an alternative way. And it would be a good way if you think your data is gonna fit in the hash table well, but you want to make sure that even if it gets full, it's still going to work reasonably well. All right, we won't do any code for chaining, but you can imagine what it would be. We would basically just have a link list and we would make an array of link lists, which is a thing you can do. You know, you can make arrays of any of the data structures we've seen so far, or you can make a link list of arrays or a link list of link lists. Here we would have an array of link lists. And when we do insert, we call our hash method to get the index. Then we insert it into the link list that's in the corresponding cell. Likewise, when it comes time to do a lookup operation, we again call our hash function to get the link list we need to search. And then we would do linear search on that link list. Hopefully that makes sense, but I don't think we need to go into the code for it. So now the next thing to talk about is sort of revisiting the performance analysis we talked about last time in light of having these collisions dealt with. 
So like I said last time, a hash table isn't just a data structure that you can just pick and put all your data in, assuming that it's going to give you good performance. You have to think about it just a little bit more. And there's two basic things you need to think about. One is to make sure that your table is big enough, because if your table isn't big enough to hold all the data and hold your data with gaps in it, it's not going to give you performance. So let's imagine that we have linear probing and we have an array where it's mostly filled. Most of the cells are filled up with data and there's only a few blanks. So it looks sort of like this. Well, if there's only a few blanks in the entire table, then you're going to have to search through a decent portion of the table in order to find the thing you're looking for. Like if you have maybe 10% or 25% of the table that is filled in contiguously with linear probing, then you're going to have to search through a tenth to a quarter of the array when you're doing a lookup. And that means that you're not really getting big O of one performance anymore because you'd be getting like it would be like 0.25n, which as we've talked about, we drop the constant. So that would be really more like big O of n. As your array gets more and more filled, the performance approaches big O of n. Same thing really if you have the chaining approach. If you have all of these link lists that you're searching for and you have a decent percentage of the table is, is in the second, third, fourth, etc. cell of a link list, you're having to search through more and more portion of the data to find the thing you're looking for. So it approaches big O of n. So really what we need is we need it to be big enough to minimize the collisions. Collisions should be pretty rare. And so when we're doing this, when you're thinking about using a hash table, you should make it like more than twice as big as the amount of data you're expecting to handle which is kind of wasteful for memory. So that's sort of the trade-off with hash tables. To get the really good performance, you have to be a little bit wasteful with memory, which sometimes is a problem, but sometimes isn't. So that's one thing you need to think about. The other thing you need to think about is the quality of your hash function. And what this means is that the hash function needs to do a good job spreading the data around across the entire range. So let's say that you have a graph and think about the potential indices that you could give, where this is all the way from zero to n minus one for whatever your n is, maybe it's 10,000 or a million or whatever, however big the table is gonna be. Well, what you need to have is you need to have your hash function give you a relatively uniform distribution. And so in statistics, a distribution means like, how likely each of the things is to occur based on the hash function we have. And so if this is a uniform distribution, which would look like a flat line like this, what that would mean is that the index zero is just as likely to occur as the index 10, as the index 500, as the index 2017. All of those numbers should be equally likely to be given as your hash value. What you don't want to have is like a non-uniform distribution like this. Maybe it starts like this and then dips down and then starts like this and goes like that. I don't know. Any kind of thing that's not uniform would be bad. And so what this means is that these indices, the early ones, like let's say zero through a hundred in this graph are way more likely to be given than indices a thousand through 2000 or whatever. And so it can be hard to know from looking at your hash method how good it's doing, how good it's spreading the indices about the possible range of values it could give. And let's think about why this is bad for a second. Well, if you have a really non-uniform distribution like this, then these parts of the hash table that are more likely to be given are going to be like slammed with collisions because the hash function is giving them out as the indices for more keys than the other areas, which are like this. So even if your hash table is big enough, if you have a non-uniform distribution like this, it's possible that certain areas of it will be really congested and filled with data, while other areas are kind of just like empty and don't have any value stored in them at all. So even though there's enough space in theory in the hash table for everyone to fit with, with space between them, you're going to have a lot of collisions in these areas where the hash function wasn't very good. 
And so these are the two real sort of keys when it comes to doing the performance analysis for a hash function, uh, for a hash table really. You need to make sure that your hash function is good. And in most cases, when you're a professional programmer, oftentimes it, it seems that hash, func hash, uh, hash tables are used with strings as the keys, in which case you can use like the built-in Java hash code method works really well. But you need to think about it for your particular application and make sure that it's actually doing well. Also, it's potential, you have the potential that you would use keys that aren't strings, and then you need to think about it yourself and think about what the best way of doing hashing is for that application. Also, you need to make it big enough. If you do those two things though, and you minimize the collisions that way, the performance will be basically big O of one. So that's the goal of hash tables, like we said, being as fast as possible inserting and as fast as possible lookup. And you do have to think about these things to make sure you get that goal, but that's why hash tables are so popular and widely used because they are so fast. So that's all for this week on hash tables. We've talked about how hash tables work and the different operations they have, the insert and the lookup. Then we talked about two different ways to deal with the possibilities of collisions, and we spent some time talking about the performance characteristics of them. There's sort of a slightly more fiddly data structure than others. You need to sort of have a bounds of how much data could be stored in order to make sure that it's the right choice. But if what you need is to insert data, and to then search for that data, and you know roughly how much data you're going to be dealing with total, there's really no better data structure than a hash table for it. All right, so thanks uh, for watching this week. Next week, we're going to talk about recursion a little bit. Thanks.